We are for the church and for the kingdom. This vision drives everything we do. There are many noble causes and institutions in this world, and we care about the future of seminaries, academies, governments, social causes, and parachurch ministries, but they are not fundamentally why we exist. We exist for the future of the church and the advancement of God's kingdom. With God's help, our students today will be the pastors, ministers, and missionaries of the global church tomorrow. We teach the Bible in the classroom so that generations of churches will be sturdy outposts of Christ's kingdom. This is how we serve the church, and this is how we bless every other good and noble endeavor until God's glory covers the earth like the waters cover the sea. Will you join us? The title of this lecture is Spurgeon's Devotional Life. And the subtitle is A Gregarious Spirituality, The Devotional Piety of Charles Haddon Spurgeon. According to the late Carl F. H. Henry, Charles Spurgeon is one of evangelical Christianity's immortals. And the purpose of this address, this paper, this lecture is to examine the spirituality, the personal spirituality of this immeasurably influential preacher. Spurgeon is one of the church's most iconic preachers. And if you were asked to describe Spurgeon in one word, I'm sure that 99% of those who would respond would say preacher. But what about the personal piety behind the pulpit presence? Spurgeon was a breathtakingly busy man. We often look back in, in terms of a, a golden days of a slower time in the Victorian age there in England, but he lived at a pace of life that would be recognizable to every one of us. And yet, in the midst of the pressure of unending responsibilities and ever-looming deadlines, he maintained a consistent, a vibrant, and what I will call gregarious spirituality. So I have a number of headings here. I'm just going to enumerate them for you if you're taking notes. Very briefly, the first one is the priority of Spurgeon's piety. The priority. Spurgeon manifested such an effervescent piety because of his, uh, the primacy of his relationship with God. This was the pinnacle of his priorities. His piety, and just as an aside, when you hear the word piety in Christian literature and circles and so forth, uh, there's a generic use that basically refers to their Christian life. He was a man or she was a woman of consistent Christian piety. It means they were real Christians. In all of their life, they lived like a Christian. But often we mean devotional piety, basically their personal devotional life, and that's the way I'm using the term piety uh, today. Spurgeon's piety was the means by which he cultivated and experienced, experienced the reality of the divine human relationship. So nothing was more important to him than that. The chief element of Spurgeon's entire career, writes biographer Arnold Dallimore, was his walk with God. Chief element, his entire career was his walk with God. And when it came to the exercise of his pastoral influence, he must at times have felt the temptation to rely on his extraordinary gifts, his exceptional uh, mental faculties, and his abundant stock of, of tangible resources, 12,000 books in a library of which 8,000 are right across the way. And yet, instead, he said, that's not what's most important to me. He said, it will be in vain for me to stock my library or organize societies or project schemes if I neglect the culture of myself. For books and agencies and systems are only remotely the instruments of my holy calling. My own spirit, soul, and body are my nearest machinery for sacred service. My spiritual faculties and my inner life are the battle axe and weapons of war. Spurgeon believed this same priority of piety held true for every minister, for every one of you. At the very outset of his published lectures to his pastor's college students, he mandated this for them 
what he found essential for himself. True and genuine piety is necessary as the first indispensable requisite. Whatever call a man may pretend to have, if he has not been called to holiness, he certainly has not been called to the ministry. If he's not been called to holiness, he has not been called to the ministry. Second, Spurgeon's Christocentric piety. And this will be my most brief uh, heading here. And the, the main idea I could summarize as Spurgeon was the most Christocentric preacher and pastor uh, perhaps ever. And his piety was just as Christocentric. Uh, one of his biographers, again, Arnold Alamore, said, Spurgeon saw in Jesus Christ spirituality exemplified. The Lord became Spurgeon's model and his pattern for true spirituality. By the way, it's a good question to ask. What is the model for true spirituality? And this is going to be expressed in, in my lecture this afternoon on Spurgeon's um, the ministry to the poor by his church. And the ba basic idea there is we often attribute all the conversions, all of the influence and the rise of the largest evangelical church in the world of 6,000 people simply to Spurgeon's unprecedented, remarkable preaching. That was a lot of it. It was foundational. But we tend to overlook uh, the influence of 1,000 people going out every Sunday night into the streets and witnessing while he was preaching and bringing in people to hear Spurgeon's great preaching. And as we heard in the last lecture, and I'll mention again this afternoon, Livonia Bartlett, a, a woman who is a Sunday school teacher who is responsible for a thousand baptisms, people added to the membership of the church. We often are unaware of these things that, that undergirded this great preaching. But in all of it, there's a Christocentric focus that we must not miss. Let me just illustrate that off, off the cuff here uh, because it's true in every part of Spurgeon's life. I teach a class called Great Christian Lives, and all we do is read and discuss the biographies of Edward Spurgeon and Lloyd-Jones. And when we're in the several weeks on Spurgeon, when we come to his preaching, I will bring to class a copy of, of a volume, individual volume, of the Metropolitan Tabernacle, you know, the collected 63 volumes of Spurgeon's sermon. And so if I have 20 students in the class, I, I hand each of them uh, a volume. And, you know, they're, they're annual. They're, these are his sermons for 1867. Then you can pull 1868 and 1869. And I will say to the class, okay, open to any sermon you want, front to back, any sermon at random. And they do. And then I say, go to the last page of that sermon. And they do. And then I ask, does he preach Christ on the last page of that sermon? And I've done this with literally hundreds of students starting here. And in the hundreds of times when I've had students check for this, I've not had one exception where he failed to preach Christ. And incidentally, the Spirit was sent to magnify Christ, right? Right? Well, when can we expect the Spirit's blessing upon our preaching and teaching more than when we're preaching Christ? And no one preached Christ more or better, I think, than Spurgeon. So is it any wonder why he had such remarkable blessings and results in his preaching? Uh, no one was more Christocentric. No one preached Christ more or better. And he saw unprecedented uh, results. But that illustration about from his preaching is true in all of his life, including his piety. That's the point I was making there. Next heading is the role of the Bible, the Bible in Spurgeon's devotional life. While he believed God was both the source and the goal of his piety, the unquestioned guide and authority for Spurgeon's devotional piety, and indeed all of his life, was the Bible. Now, he read widely, he read voluminously, but no book rivaled its influence on Spurgeon. No book rivaled the Bible. 
He believed that not only the ideas contained in the Bible, but the very words of Scripture were inspired by the Holy Spirit. And thus they were without error in all that they intended to convey. The downgrade controversy makes clear Spurgeon was certainly aware of other views in terms of the doctrine of Scripture, <clears throat> but he simply was not persuaded by them. He considered the Bible to be the terminus of divine revelation, and he would not accept a popular belief promulgated by many Quakers in his day that, quote, the same spirit that gave forth the Scriptures could lead the faithful into new truth. That is, Revelation was not closed or confined to Scripture. To the end of his life, he never wavered from the bibliology with which he had begun his ministry. Here's a very personal glimpse into that. He had his Bible, and in the flyleaf of the Bible, he wrote um, this at the beginning. C.H. Spurgeon, 1856, the lamp of my study. Next line, the light is bright as ever, 1861. Next line, oh, that mine eyes were more opened, 1864. Being worn to pieces, rebound, 1870. The lantern mended and the light as joyous to mine eyes as ever. Now, perhaps these hidden exclamations, hidden away, in the Bible he kept in his study, may tell us almost as much about his view of Scripture as what he published in his sermons and in his books. It also reveals the steadfastness in these convictions. That first entry, he was the age of many of you students. He was 22. The final entry there, after the, it had been rebound, was written by a, a seasoned and and uh, battle-weary pastor of 36, but he still has the convictions they had about the Bible that he began his ministry with. Now, it's been shown elsewhere, uh, even at this conference already, that from childhood, like the biblical Timothy, Spurgeon had been acquainted with the sacred writings, 2 Timothy 3.15. Every formative influence on Spurgeon as a child or youth cherished the Bible. And as he grew, he accepted without reservation the teachings of the Bible as true. And by the time he was just 16 and preaching regularly, but not yet pastoring at Water Beach, the basic contours of his daily piety were already formed and they would be sustained throughout his lifetime. Biographer W.Y. Fullerton said of him in those days, in the early morning, he was up praying and reading the Bible before school. But an analysis of what other writers, and one I, I've cut out here, G. Holden Pike, one of those who knew Spurgeon best, wrote the largest six-volume biography of, of Spurgeon. They often fail to indicate attention to one of the most important aspects of Spurgeon's approach to Scripture, namely meditation. Meditation. Spurgeon did not merely read the Bible and read it a lot, nor did he read and study the Bible a lot. That was necessitated by his so frequent preaching. He also meditate on, meditated on it. The grasp of Scripture that he had was largely a fruit, not of just reading alone or preparing to preach, but of meditation on Scripture. And I would argue that meditation is the greatest single devotional need of most Christians today. And if it were within my power to change the devotional life of every Christian on the planet, I would start right here. With meditation on Scripture. And this was significant in Spurgeon's life, but often not particularly uh, itemized. So... He referred to meditation as holy thought, fresh fuel with which the flame of zeal in the renewed heart must be continually fed. So this holy thought for Spurgeon was constituted in two forms of meditation, two primary forms, direct and indirect. 
The direct method was simply read the Bible. After reading, choosing a, a verse, meditating on that verse directly, directly on the text of Scripture. Now, if there's a specific or consistent structure to Spurgeon's thought pattern, uh, we don't know how he did that. Uh, Dr. Allen sent me the text of the student he saw yesterday reading uh, my Spiritual Listman's book, but I was alarmed. Someone permitted him to use the original edition rather than the revised edition. And if that student's professor is in the room, let them be so uh, notified. But in that edition, the first edition, there are six methods of meditation. There are 17 in the uh, revised edition and uh, that of the 10,000 additional words in the new edition. That's one of the most significant things is on meditation and the additional ones there. And I've come up with half a dozen more since then. We don't have any methods like that from Spurgeon. We don't know exactly how. And by the way, that's to impress upon us. There's no one way to meditate on Scripture many ways to meditate on the text of Scripture. We don't know exactly how Spurgeon did that. I, I wish we did. In one sense, it may be good that we, we don't know. But his extraordinary facility for the use of imagery in his, in his preaching and writing, his, uh, I, I think, argues for a very unusually active imagination at work when he was engaged in meditation on Scripture. Again, using the imagination, but on the text. Regardless of what method he used, the principle of Christ-centeredness in his piety remains constant, as it does in every other part of his piety as well. As indicated in this exhortation to meditation from Spurgeon, long more and more to see Jesus. Meditation is often like windows of agate, and gates of carbuncle. Not a phrase used in this chapel too frequently, I would suppose, but very Spurgeonic. Through which, the, the, what he's saying, there's sort of bejeweled windows through which we behold a Redeemer. Meditation puts the telescope to the eye and enables us to see Jesus after a better sort than we could have seen him if we had lived on the, in the days of his flesh. That's significant. Let me say that again. Meditation puts the telescope to the eye and enables us to see Jesus after a better sort than we could have seen him if we had lived in the days of his flesh. Of course, we have more written revelation than we would have had. Would that our conversation, our, our lifestyle be more in heaven and that we were more taken up with the person, the work, the beauty of our incarnate Lord, more meditation and the beauty of the King would flash upon us with more resplendence. More resplendence. Great word there. So let me move from the Bible to Spurgeon in private prayer. Now, the Bible occupied the, occupied the preeminent and foundational position, both in Spurgeon's personal piety and his ministry, but he regarded the sincere practice of Christian prayer as uh, the sin qua non of the Christian life. And I'm, I almost find this a little controversial uh, from, from Spurgeon. He said, if anyone should ask me for an epitome of the Christian religion, I would say that it is in one word, prayer. If I should be asked, what will take in the whole of Christian experience? I would answer, prayer. A man must have been convinced of sin before he could pray. Did I do that? Oh, okay. It sounded so loud, I thought, what, what did I just do? Okay. A man must have been convinced of sin before he could pray. He must have had some hope that there was mercy for him before he could pray. In fact, all the Christian virtues are locked up in that word, prayer. Do but tell me that you see a man, you are a man of prayer, and I will reply at once, Sir, I have no doubt of the reality as well as the sincerity of your religion. And I say I have a little problem with that because I would have expected it to be something about the Scriptures. And I, I don't know whether... He's speaking sort of hyperbolically here and would agree, oh, yes, yes, you could put 
meditation on scripture where I put prayer here and it would, I'd still mean that. But um, I did find it a little interesting that he s- describes the whole of the Christian life here in prayer. But that does say something, it says a lot about his own, the role of prayer in his personal devotion life. <clears throat> now there's some uncertainty that exists about how Spurgeon prayed. This is insightful and I think encouraging to most of us. If not a little confusing at points. There's some reason to believe that he regularly engaged in what may, may be described as episodic prayer. That is, periods of sustained prayer. Get alone, pray for half an hour. Walk and pray for an hour. But times where he did nothing but pray, episodic prayer, uh, some evidence for that. Spurgeon himself lends support to this, at least by implication, when he writes, the habit of regular morning and evening prayer is one which is indispensable to a believer's life. But the prescribing of the length of prayer and the constrained remembrance of so many persons and subjects may gender into bondage. In other words, when your prayer list gets too long, it feels more like bondage. And strangle prayer rather than assist it. Spurgeon was so visual. That's, I, I think if there's a, an explanation to the human side of, of uh, things, it's not only that he was so Christocentric in his preaching, we can imitate that. We can't be Spurgeonic in so many ways. We can imitate the Christ-likeness in his preaching and aspire after the visual nature of his communication, which I would argue was cultivated in meditation. But here's an example of that. We talk about it would strangle prayer. Let's see. Similarly, he gives the impression of encouraging periods of uninterrupted prayer when he exhorts his students, you cannot pray too long in private. We do not limit you to 10 minutes there or 10 hours or 10 weeks, if you like. The more you are on your knees alone, the better. In his interpretive biography of the preacher, John C. Carlyle maintains that Spurgeon engaged in frequent episodic prayer, stating that Spurgeon would sit at the end of his study with his back, you know, the long table we see often pictures of. He sits at the end, his back to the little uh, private sanctum to which he would often retire for prayer. Spurgeon would dictate by the hour and then go to his little room and in a few moments return to begin again. Although his description of Spurgeon's habits in regard to private prayer indicates knowledge of quite a few specifics, and though he was a student at the pastor's college and thus might have observed Spurgeon's activities in his study firsthand, Carlisle does not cite a source for this information about being in the study and going to the room alone because he would have had, um, I'm forgetting the name of his secretaries there uh, with him. But a larger body of evidence indicates that Spurgeon's personal practice of prayer would be characterized as more continual than episodic. It's reasonable to assume that virtually all Christians who consider themselves prayerful would affirm that they pray brief prayers at moments throughout the day, even in the midst of routine activities such as driving or working or walking to chapel. You might briefly throw up a two-second prayer. I think we would all admit this is normal. But it seems that when Spurgeon and others refer to his praying throughout the day, they mean something more than this. In one sermon, he spoke of his experience of praying short prayers all throughout the day, an experience he seems to believe is normative for Christians. Spurgeon says, I always feel that there is something wrong if I go without prayer for even half an hour in the day. I cannot understand how a Christian man can go from morning to evening without prayer. I cannot comprehend how he lives and how he fights the battle of life without asking the guardian care of God while the arrows of inspiration of temptation are flying so thickly around him. I cannot imagine how he can decide what to do in terms of 
perplexity, how he can see his own imperfections or the faults of others without feeling constrained to say all day long, oh Lord, guide me. Oh Lord, forgive me. Oh Lord, bless my friend. I cannot think how he can be continually receiving mercies without saying, God be thanked for this new token of his grace. Blessed be the name of the Lord for what he is doing for me in his abounding mercy. O Lord, still remember me with the favor that thou showest unto thy people. Do not be content, dear brethren and sisters, unless you call prayer everywhere and at all times and so obey the apostolic injunction, pray without ceasing. But beyond this, Spurgeon also had a reputation for praying brief prayers like those described above throughout the day. The resulting impression caused biographers like Dalimore to, to write this, Spurgeon was ever a man of prayer. Not that he spent any long periods of time in prayer, but he lived in the spirit of communion with God. Likewise, in his introduction to a collection of Spurgeon's pulpit prayers, Densdale Young says, prayer was the instinct of his soul and the atmosphere of his life. It would seem, however, that the knowledge of how inwardly prayerful Spurgeon actually was would be impossible to ascertain without, uh, unless either he prayed aloud or else Spurgeon himself disclosed the information. In fact, he may have done both. For Fullerton suggests, if we, w if we may venture <clears throat> to observe the inner life of this man, so greatly honored of God in the world, we shall not find Spurgeon often on his knees. And that he did not because he, he did not pray, but because he prayed incessantly. Between the closing of one book and the opening of another, with Spurgeon there were the shut eyes and the moving lips. I always feel it well just to put a few words of prayer between everything I do, he once said to an intimate friend. Not a bad practice for students or preachers to put down one book and pray before picking up the next. Spurgeon himself, <coughs> excuse me, encouraged such a prayer for lifestyle in, the, in a lecture to his students in the pastor's college. I take it that as a minister, <coughs> excuse me, he is always praying. Whenever his mind turns to his work, whether he is in it or out of it, he offers a petition, sending up his holy desires as well-directed arrows to the skies. He is not always in the act of prayer, but he lives in the spirit of it. If his heart be in his work, he cannot eat or drink or take recreation or go back to his bed or rise in the morning without evermore feeling a fervency of desire, of a weight of anxiety and a simplicity of dependence upon God. Thus, in one form or another, he continues in prayer. If there be any man under heaven who is compelled to carry out the precept, pray without ceasing, surely it is the Christian minister. Now, from what others have written, this description here may have been more autobiographical than, uh, than he expressed. In an excerpt from one of his sermons on prayer, he explicitly conveys his compulsion about continual prayer. Minute by minute, moment by moment, somehow or other, my heart must commune with my God. Prayer has become as essential to me as the heaving of my lungs. Notice that. He didn't just say breathing. So visual. The heaving of my lungs or the beating of my pulse. Now this is encouraging because one of the most revealing pieces of data about Spurgeon's prayer life in his private practice, uh, for one place Spurgeon makes plain that due to wandering thoughts, caused in part, no doubt, by as many heavy responsibilities. He could not, quote, pray by the half hour together very well. My thoughts began to wonder. And I read that and sigh, well, at last, some indication, feet of clay here. <laughs> However, it seems that at least occasionally he did so. In fact, 
Twice in his life, he was known to have prayed through the night. Once before his uh, son, uh, Thomas, I believe, was, one, was going to be traveling to, Mich- to Australia uh, to give his life to the work of missions. In one sermon on prayer, he urged Christians the imperative of making time for your engagement with God, especially when there seems to be no time for prayer, saying, you will, if you're a watchful Christian, have your times of daily devotion. Never give up the morning prayer, nor the evening prayer, nor the prayer at midday, if such has grown to be your habit. And yet, in the same message, he continued, between these times of devotion, labor to be much in brief arrow prayer. Broken sentences and interjections. Let short sentences go up to heaven. I and we may shoot upwards cries and single words such as ah and oh and oh that. Or without words, we may pray in the upward glancing of the eye or the sigh of the heart. So I think the reality is Spurgeon's prayer life was both episodic and continual. It was not uncommon for Spurgeon to devote himself entirely to prayer, at least for a few minutes. Yet he also prayed in broken sentences and interjections, as he said, both silently and publicly throughout the day. But it does seem that from both Spurgeon's own words and the observations of others, his prayer life was characterized more by continual prayer than by daily episodes in prayer. That Spurgeon distinguished more by continual prayer than episodic, at least as perceived by others, can be illustrated in a passage from Fullerton's biography, a section that also splendidly demonstrates the gregarious nature of his spirituality. Archibald G. Brown, so this is uh, one biographer, this is Fullerton quoting another, our friend, a very good friend of Spurgeon's, Archibald Brown, tells how in a railway journey with him, they knelt down in the rail car and spent a time in prayer. Dr. Wayland Hoyt says, I was walking with him in the woods one day just outside London, and as we strolled under the shadow of the summer foliage, we came upon a log athwart the path. Come, he said, as naturally as one would say if he were hungry and bread were just put before him. Come, let us pray. And kneeling beside the log, he lifted his soul to God in the most loving, outpouring, and yet reverent prayer. Then, rising from his knees as naturally, he went strolling on talking about this and that. The prayer was no parenthesis interjected. It was something that belonged as much to the habit of his mind as breathing did to the habit of his body. Dr. Kyler bears a similar testimony. In one of the Surrey woods, wooded areas, they were conversing in high spirits when suddenly Spurgeon stopped and said, come, Theodore, let us thank God for laughter. That was how he lived, from a jest to a prayer meant for him the breadth of a straw. So whether in his study or in public with an assistant, who silently observed or with friends in conversation, whether pausing in the midst of activities or praying in the midst of them, Spurgeon was said to have lived a life of prayer. As Spurgeon put it, our heart renewed by the Holy Ghost must be like the magnetized needle, which always has an inclination toward the pole. I think what he's saying is life has the, the needle of our minds and souls all over the place sometimes by, demand, by the demands, but sooner or later, it's going to come back to true north, back to thoughts of God, conversing with God, even if for a few moments. Well, I'm going to have to skip Spurgeon in solitude. Um, and I wanted to pursue this because a, a, an unbelievably busy man I would argue more so than than any of us um, because of the the so heavy responsibilities. Uh, But he uh, he did not, he wasn't a man of solitude like Edwards by any means. He seemed to enjoy it, but even then he would spend times of solitude with 
someone else. He would go on a ride in the country, but take someone with him. And I think as a, such a gregarious person, he would be called what today would be called a people person. I think he did not have the need for solitude that many of us, myself included, do, or like Edwards did. And I think he often found in people what some of us find in solitude. And that's all I'm going to be able to say about that, and even less about fasting. Um, and I have material I did not even bring with me on, on Spurgeon and journaling, which he did early on. <clears throat> but um, Spurgeon, I'm, I'm looking at a line here where he says, there is a lightness, he's talking about fasting, that comes over the frame, over the body, especially of bulky people like myself. <laughs> because I would hazard a guess that when I said Spurgeon and fasting, many of you thought of a, one of the many photographs of Spurgeon, Spurgeon in which it appears he, is not a, he, he did not overdo the discipline <laughs> of fasting. But he does advocate it. He does teach on it. Now, he does say Jesus did not make a great deal of this, although he would turn around and then talk about when you fast, how to do this, in the Sermon on the Mount. But he lived in a time, Spurgeon did, in Victorian England when there were often national days of humiliation and fasting. Early on in his ministry in the late 1850s, in fact, the largest congregation to which he ever preached, more than 23,000 was in a day of national humiliation, fasting, and prayer. And, that, and he was asked to be the preacher at that. So let me turn the last aspect of his piety, and that is Spurgeon and family worship. Leading the daily worship of God in the Spurgeon home for all family members and guests was an essential part of Spurgeon's piety. Though there wasn't a, a clear proof text on this, he believed such a devotional expression to be thoroughly biblical in accord, he says, with the genius and spirit of the gospel and commended by the example of the saints. In the doctrinal statement of the Metropolitan Tabernacle, a document Spurgeon treasured so highly, he placed a copy of it along with the Bible in a box over which the pulpit was built. Not a removable pulpit like this, but the entire pulpit area was placed over the Bible and the church's doctrinal statement indicating they were the foundation and the message of what was to be preached in that place. And in that doctrinal statement, one passage explicitly prescribed family worship. Quote, God is to be worshiped everywhere in spirit and in truth, whether in private families daily, in secret by each individual, <coughs> are solemnly in the public assemblies. These are not to be carelessly or willfully neglected or forsaken when God by His Word and providence calls upon them. So anyone who wants to understand Spurgeon's piety must take into account not only his own ancestral habits of family worship, but the seriousness with which he embraced the church's confession of faith. Many spiritual traditions, the monastic one being an obvious example, have not emphasized this aspect of piety. But for Spurgeon, there were three spheres of devotion, personal, familial, and congregational. At 6 o'clock each evening, all the household gathered in Spurgeon's study for worship. And there were often a lot of outsiders there, guests. We know once uh, John A. Broadus was there, we know once... Uh, James uh, Pettigrew Boyce, both founders of Southern Seminary, were there. He was the best-known name in Christendom. Um, people all over the world sought his advice. He presided over more than 66 different ministries, not to mention the largest evangelical church in the world. There was no telephone in those days. So uh, a lot of people were often at the house, and if they were still there at 6 in the evening, all of them gathered into his study for worship. Three primary elements in family worship. Referring to the famous Bible commentator Matthew Henry, Spurgeon affirmed these elements. I agree with Matthew Henry when he says, they that pray in the family do well. 
<clears throat> they that pray and read the scriptures do better, but they that pray and read and sing do best of all. There's a completeness in that kind of family worship which is much to be desired. Well, he thought the lack of family worship is the reason why many families, their children turn out so poorly. And here is Susanna describing an episode of family worship. After the meal was over, an adjournment was made to the study for family worship. And it was at these seasons that my beloved's prayers were remarkable for their tender childlikeness, their spiritual pathos, and their intense devotion. He seemed to come as near to God as a little child to a loving father. And we were often moved to tears as he talked thus face to face with his Lord. And I wish I've got a longer illustration from a guest in the home, but I, he concludes by saying, Mr. Spurgeon, when bowed before God in family prayer, appeared a grander man even than when holding thousands spellbound by his oratory. Spurgeon said of family worship, I esteem it so highly that no language of mine can adequately express my sense of its value. No language of mine can adequately express my sense of the value of family worship. Now, you know enough about Spurgeon to know when he had no words to describe what he thought about something, he thought a great deal about it indeed. All right, now let me conclude. Spurgeon was human, thus he was flawed, even if the conventions of Victorian England and the biases or biases of his many hagiographers concealed the weaknesses. Nevertheless, those who want to build a case against Spurgeon's piety, his personality, his ability, or Christian consistency based upon evidence and not presumption will find little in print on which to substantiate their position. Spurgeon had his critics. But after the attacks of the early years, which were primarily based upon his youth, his zeal, his detractors were mostly theological critics. That is, those who did not accuse him of personal faults so much as they differed with him doctrinally. But whenever his opponents in any sphere or at any time in his life, whatever they said of him, no one ever cast suspicions on Spurgeon's piety. Spurgeon had countless devoted supporters and he had opponents. Though he was many things to many people, this paper, I trust, has established that in all his roles and relationships, Charles Haddon Spurgeon was a man of intense and practical spirituality. To confirm this, it's been necessary to go beyond the legend that is Spurgeon, the preacher, the writer, the educator, the controversialist, and philanthropist, to show that in the fulfillment of all these responsibilities, he was preeminently a man of prayer. He was, writes Drummond, a spiritual man in every sense of the word. His spirituality profoundly touched lives. His spirituality is traceable in his pastoral relationships, in his preaching, including his public prayers, and throughout his pastoral publications. The heart of his piety was Jesus Christ, experiencing and loving and following and proclaiming him. The Bible regulated Spurgeon's spirituality and was its ultimate authority. But perhaps what is most remarkable, given his incessant schedule and the innumerable demands made upon him is simply that he would become and remain a consistently pious and prayerful person to the end of his days. The pressures of time did not produce in him as they sometimes do in the hectic lives of busy leaders, a shallow or hypocritical spirituality. Rather, they resulted in tandem with his outgoing personality, what we have characterized as a gregarious spirituality. When the name of Spurgeon is referenced from Christian history, too often a single identity, preacher, that's in the box. One word for Spurgeon, preacher, is associated with his memory. I have attempted to set forth a proposal that the identity of deeply pious pastor is another that should be conjoined with that name. 
Spurgeon's sermons will be long remembered. Equally so should be the reputation of his piety. What he wrote to his ministerial students, I believe he would say to us all today. Brethren, for our Lord's sake, maintain a high degree of spirituality. May the Holy Spirit enable you so to do. Live in God so that you may live for God. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for the life and the example of Charles Spurgeon because he points us to Christ. You've given us in Scripture the command to have spiritual heroes. Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the outcome of their faith, imitate them. So thank you for men like Charles Spurgeon we have to imitate so that we may know Christ better and be more like Christ. But we thank you for that very next verse, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thank you for such a Christ-like servant we see in Spurgeon. May we follow his admonition to live in God so that we may live for God. We ask in Jesus' name and for your glory. Amen.